good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here with you guys to present um, a talk and also to interview with you people. And hopefully, we'll have a good conversation and see where we go with this from here. Uh, today's talk is going to be called Climate Change and the Built Environment. Climate Change and the Built Environment, looking at designing with nature as adaptation to resilient strategy. And I will basically approach this from different perspectives. First of all, I'll introduce the idea of climate change and why it's important. And then secondly, uh, I will look at a few projects I've worked on, just to show the some of the kind of research work I've worked on that relates to climate change and working with nature, and some of the things that I'm, I'm planning to work on as I go ahead. Um, at the end of it, probably if there's time, I may show examples of some of my teaching in studios, some of my exam work from my students' work, uh, just out of, um, if there's time, as curiosity more than anything else. OK. So if you look at the US and China, both countries are responsible for about 45% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. This is according to uh, International Energy uh, Association, uh, 2014. And CO2 emissions constitute about 82% of the US GHC, GHG emissions in 2012. So of course, the amount is going to increase over time because our consumption is increasing over time. Uh, the building sector itself, part of the built environment, accounts to about 36% of the emissions in developed countries, where US is included. Therefore, in this case here, the idea here is that good design should result in low emissions. If you design good buildings, emissions should go down. How much lower, we don't know yet, but we can, we can simulate and project um, our thinking in that area there. Um, space heating, space cooling, water heating, and lighting are the main components of where this emission comes from, other than just emission of embodied energy in construction. Um, if you look at, for example, in hot, humid climates, like where I am in Miami, um, hot water and cooling alone accounts for over 50%. Of the, of the energy consumption, which is very interesting because in Miami, solar, solar energy is not very, very widely used for heating at all, which is very strange. So let's go back to the idea of sustainability coming from Brand, uh, Brandtland Commission, where they talk about the, our common, common future, 1987, and they, they basically define sustainable development as one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. So basically, we think beyond today and think of the future. We invest for the future today. We don't invest for the future tomorrow. And within this idea here is the idea that there's limitation which is, which is imposed on technology to solve all the problems. Climate change, high temperatures, all that isn't an issue. Just use air conditioning. Technology will solve the problem. That's the main thinking of a lot of people in places like Miami, for example. And also, the idea of also limitation imposed by social organization of the environments are built to meet the present needs and the future. So we need to think about that very carefully as we go forward. So if you look at climate change predictions, um, people have looked at this. The predictions under I IPCC in different scenarios, you're looking at temperatures under B1, 1.8 to 4 degrees centigrade between 1990 to 2100. Uh, Fahrenheit, 4 degrees is probably about 7.8 degrees Fahrenheit. It's quite significant. Also, you're going to have a lot of precipitation increase. Uh, if you're in Boulder, there's going to be more rain, more, less, less snow, which means it gets wet, becomes Scotland. So that could be an issue, humidity levels. Uh, extreme events will increase over time. There'll be variability, and it becomes very difficult to predict. So those become problems we have to deal with in our day-to-day -day activities. If you're in Miami, sea level rise, anything from four inches to 35 inches, up to three feet. If you live in Miami, you own buildings, deny that that exists because it's not good for your buildings. But actually, it, it does occur, mainly through, due to what you call thermal expansion. Um, also, if you look at the, the situation of climate change prediction, typically the best estimate for low scenario, B1, is basically what you're looking here, um, a case where you have the low range, okay, it's not working, but it doesn't matter. You're looking at something in the range of about um, 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit, which is likely to be the range on the lower side. Even that alone is a lot of temperature difference 
right out there. For high end, you're looking at about 7.2 degrees, which is quite significant um, if you're living in a building because comfort range can change significantly with those kinds of temperature changes. <coughs> so broadly, these are all consistent. Uh, they're not directly comparable, but at least we know for a fact that things are going to change. Then there's a question here then on the issue of climate change and reliability. The deniers will say, how reliable is this? And there's this cartoon that I, that I found where somebody says, talking to the dad and says, dad, how come they can tell us about the weather about, in about 50 years from now, but they can't even predict what happens in Boulder tomorrow, in 15 days' time? You can be a skeptic by looking at it this way. However, in reality, the question that arises then, even though we can't, make the change, we can't predict the changes in 15, um, 15 days, uh, we, we know that the prediction over the time has been going forward. So we should not actually just deny because we can't predict 15 days from today, we, we are not going to see a change. So does it even matter? Yes, it does. So what are the effects of climate change? Climate change is expected to cause different e effects on people. For example, if you look at diseases, you're looking at changes in temperature and humidity play an important part to this. Uh, some of the effects already seen, for example, if you look at increased in health risks due to extreme events, if you look at, say, for example, in 2010, we had heat wave in, in the EU and in the US. If you look at um, heat wave, you have problems involving also continual modification of climate. If you're a farmer, my, my parents are farmers, we cannot predict when to plant our crops. It becomes very difficult at all. So what can be done if you're in a built environment? What has this to do with us? One, we can begin to look at the issue of resilience. Build things that are resilient. Where resilience here lo looks at the function indicating the capacity of a system to sustain a level of functionality or performance over time or period. This was coined by Bruno in 2003. Also, you can choose an option called adaptation, which you decide, I'm just going to look at the efforts to anticipate and prepare for the change of climate change and reduce any burdens. Build sea walls, stop it from coming in. You can do that. They did that in, in, um, in, in, in Louisiana. And we know what happened when New Orleans was flooded with extreme events. Climate change, extreme events are very difficult to handle. So I think <laughs> resiliency probably is a better approach rather than some of the adaptation that we have there. Sometimes adaptation works well. Mitigation. You can try and slow, stabilize, reduce climate change by changing behavior, changing building code, reduce emission of greenhouse gases. So either way, as you go over time, we're looking at functionality and performance, which the buildings will have, and how that is reflected in criteria of safety and serviceability. So we look at that in terms of resilience. Uh, we're looking at also the issue of robustness, buildings being very robust and redundant, allowing for water to flood and then leave when, it, when time comes for it becomes very, very important in this sense. Adaptation responses to important principles is the issue of effective protection of the environment, either through behavior change, making choices, and legislation. Legislation comes in things through things like building codes, lead, BRIAM, so things attempts to deal with this issue of adapt adaptive responses. Also, we can look at another thing, which is continual monitoring of the changes in emissions over time. So for example, building, building code changes today, we look at the effect of building, building code over the next five years. When it changes again, we look at the effect to see if that direction is actually useful. So continuous monitoring is a very useful principle of, of solving problems. Um, also, talking to people about wise use of resources. So hence, in this case, in terms of designing buildings that rely on active systems, we begin to go back to nature and begin to look at passive systems, begin to look at carbon emission issues associated with footprints locally, local resource materials, locally in it produced energy, and also looking at ways in which your systems will rely on uh, the environment, rely on the sun, rely on the ground to either heat or cool your building. So we have the smart growth principles, we have got continual monitoring, and all those are things that are very important for sustainable buildings. So let's look at design in terms of sustainability. Five strategies become very important. The first one is let nature do work for you. Take care of nature. Nature has been there for a long time. It has so much resource. Let's use nature 
as much as possible to do work for you. And I'll demonstrate how that is, can be done. Also, aggregate rather than isolate. Instead of doing one single building, do a cohort of buildings. Do a neighborhood level, because the capacities are much better than actually single buildings. Um, use shape to guide flow. If you're shaping buildings in terms of you want ventilation to occur, get chimney effect, get height to allow this to occur through your building. So that becomes very important, shaping the building to deal with the issue of flow. Um, also use information to replace power. Information in the sense that let the sensor that we have, the internet of things, tell the systems when to close windows, when to open them, rather than wait to open windows manually. Uh, for example, I went to the bathroom right now, and the, the window is open, which is good because it's not, it's not that cold right now. The problem is, when you leave at 5 o'clock, will someone remember to close the window? That's the issue here. But if you have a sensor there, the sensor can tell the window to close when the temperature goes too cold. So you have this operative principles dealing with those issues there. So aggregation, again, is important. As I say, nature should be both a model and a context. So look at your context all the time. Look at nature as a model to learn from. Look at, for example, termites, how they live. Look at bees, look at how they live. And borrow from there through my mimicry to work with that to get things going. Um, aggregation, match technology with need. Don't apply technology ev everywhere, but just match it with need. Not everything works everywhere. Seek common solutions to the problems. And also, the, again, smart principles becomes very important. Again, shape form to manifest the process. That becomes important as well. <coughs> and then finally, the issue of having many pathways to solve the problem, the issue of managing storage becomes very, very important. How do you store energy? Because if you look at solar energy, solar energy is only available during the day. So how do you store this and use it later? If you look at wind energy, wind energy is available only when the wind is flowing. There's no wind there, what do you do? So storage becomes a very important aspect of, of managing uh, the system. So ways to achieve this, look at solar, solar wind, geothermal systems. Look at um, on-site as much as possible rather than off-site to cut down their footprint. Uh, building materials, look at renewable materials. Look at hempcrete, for example, instead of concrete. They lock up uh, CO2 emissions, so that's very useful. Uh, look at sequencing of CO2 into the building fabric. So you begin to look at a new material that can actually absorb CO2. Uh, you look at improving insulation beyond code requirement. The code may say R, R, R15. So doing R15, do R, R20. The cost differentials in insulations is very low right now. So we, there's no point of just meeting the code. Go beyond the code. Um, look at the whole life cycle consideration in design. Think of what happens beyond that. And then measure simulation before building. Try it out before you build it. Don't just say, oh, it's ready. Try it out before you build it, because you'll know where the problems are. POE, after building it, go and learn from the building, and then you close the loop. I've learned something. The building is supposed to consume this amount of energy. It is not doing that. What went wrong? Close the loop by trying to inform new buildings on how it should be designed. Reduction in demands, also very useful for buildings. Reduce demand for consumption in buildings, identifying where the loads are, and reducing demand for that. Control heat gain through insulation. Control envelope high, high R values. Low infiltration becomes important as well. So let me go back now, go into my current research, and see how this has been applied within my research. I'm going to talk about community engagement, which comes from my PhD area. I'm going to talk about designing with nature, uh, two specific projects. I'm going to talk about energy profiles and um, IEQ metrics in buildings, and how that's important in terms of reduction. And I'm also going to talk about the epidemiological approach to energy consumption, continual monitoring of buildings, health of buildings, the way you do healthcare. Uh, in, 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 in public health and using this to work in buildings called biogreens. And then I show some of the results of some of the work I've done and some data we've collected and how that can be applied within um, design and, uh, and management of buildings. So the first one here is a project we worked on in Haiti. It's called Developing Sustainable Traditions, Innovations in Architecture and Urbanism in Regions, Towns, and Villages of Akaye. Akaye is a region in southeast of Haiti. Um, we were actually asked by Bar Foundation and Kelly Foundation to go to Haiti to work with the community there to engage them in understanding some of the problems they face and how they can solve those problems without relying on money that's coming out from, from outside. A lot of money has been poured into Haiti, 
and the impact is not there at all. So looking at how do you actually influence the community through engagement to make them be self-reliant. So the issue here was mainly empowering the population to forge their future, future by learning from the past. So here's an example of one of the, um, this was done through the Center for Community Development at University of Miami, which I was part of. And here's the, an image of what the town might look like. So we're just drawing this image of what the town might look like. And I'll go ahead and begin to show um, some of the proposed projects. So these are civil engagement projects. We're saying that if you have this project here, there's a civic community to give civic pride. So you have this here, civic pride in the center of the town. And then you have this, this area being developed as an urban area. And then the rest is being left as farmland, which supplies food for the urban community. Rather than building spread out development, we concentrate on smart growth, urban core, high density, the core, and then leave the rest as farmland because we rely on, on, on plant, uh, plantain farming to sustain this community here. So here's an um, example of another town called, um, this is Korae, small town. And in Korae, let me get this to work. It doesn't seem to work very well. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let me go in here. Korae, you can point, yeah. You look at Korae, what we're doing here, we begin to look at the city as it, as it stands, as this village, and you can see they're all scattered all over the place. So what you're doing is we begin to show them how you can begin to densify them by placing, first of all, civic buildings. There's a school right there. Um, there's a civic building here with a small little square. There's also a market here, so there's a market area. So we begin to densify the area and show them that by doing this, we can begin to densify those main corridors and leave this as farmland. That becomes very important for survival of this community. Uh, this is the other village, which is a fishing village. It's called um, Lulu. In Lulu, again, water over fishing has occurred here. And the issue that fishing is something to rely on. So building storage for fish just off the, the jetty. So the fish can be stored, cooled, and, um, frozen here before they're transported elsewhere they can be eaten. Uh, taking any things in the corners and making public buildings out of them. And then leaving the rest as dense as they are without much, much effect. But don't, don't allow you to grow into this area here, but increase density within the core here. So this is an example of one of the projects we're proposing for them, which is a typical um, Laku building in Haiti. And one of the things that we, we found out in Haiti is the issue of a lot of them had their water, this, this water right here. So they had wells somewhere there, and they had the pit latrines on this side. And what happens is that you get, the well gets contaminated. And the next guy who's on this side would have the latrine right here, which would contaminate this water system. So they get diseases coming in through. So just by beginning to show them the effect of just moving the pit latrine to the back right here, keeping the distance from that point to this point would be a better way of actually living and improving their health care. Um, begin to think of simple things like windmills, some solar panels to improve in terms of energy consumption. Having a small little shop in the front, because a lot of them are very entrepreneurial, the shop is actually where they sell the, the goods that they have and also becomes part of a place where they live, the main house and the little um, shop in the front, which is right on the urban edge, rather than walking off the street. So that's one way we're, we're showing them how you can work with this um, development there. Uh, the next one here is to look at how they can develop their buildings through phases, where this building here can be built as a phase one. You've got that being done with a porch in the front. Phase two, you build a kitchen and bathrooms. And then phase three, you add the other bedroom on the other side, and you put another porch on this side. So porches on both sides. So this is a single, what you call single family laku on a residential lot, maximizing the land. Also, the idea that instead of building them individually, as we've seen before, we can go and look at what we call urban laku, where you have a simple, um, the whole site belongs to several people. So people, this is like the way you have a small village, and each of these belongs to somebody who's different, and they're all either renting them out, or actually just building them as a family. So one family can actually build them in an organized manner, rather than this family building their own, the next family building their own, and land becomes smaller and smaller. So begin to densify through family um, consolidation. So that's what we're showing them in, in this design. And that's the 3D of it. The next thing is uh, the issue of resiliency. Uh, part of the problem they face in Haiti 
is the issue of hurricanes, earthquakes. So we, we address that through uh, strengthening the building construction, address that, that telling them that if your building actually close to the water, then the building should be raised up on stilts. So this building should be higher. So we're showing them example of the same building typology and how they can be located in different locations. Close to the water, they should allow the lower area to be open. Goats and, and, and animals can stay under there. And then if there's any floods, that area is flooded, but the main house is kept safe. So those are just examples of the same typology and how that can be used within the building. Um, solutions, example solutions that we discussed with, the, with them. This is a typical beach in some of the areas in Haiti, lots of bottles, plastic bottles, very problematic. What you do with those bottles? So begin to show them that you can take those bottles and turn them into part of construction. You build walls with the bottles because they're already there, but at least if you bring them into one area and tie them together, you can actually get this mass for the wall for construction. And this is done by Ecoterra, the work on something like that. You can use bamboo. We're showing them the idea of adobe and bamboo. This is a work by uh, Anne Herringer in Bangladesh. So I showed them this project here and asked them what they think this material is, and the project was concrete. And I showed them actually this is just adobe. And it can be done very nicely. It doesn't have to look bad, so don't have to feel socially alienated. So that's a very simple way of demonstrating the use of local materials. Um, the sea there has an, enough choppiness, enough tides, using the idea that comes from Scotland of tidal waves to generate energy from them. This is in Orkney. So you can use these tidal wave generators, which exist out there, to generate energy for, for their use. Um, the next example is actually how I work with the community, showing example of how I was engaging community, just dealing with them, talking to them in events. This is just general community, young people and explaining and demonstrating projects to them. So I was demonstrating here how the construction system doesn't work because they're using these round rocks to build walls, and once the earthquake comes in, they all fall apart because they're using mortar to hold it together. There's no masonry works by one sit on top of the other. And if you have round rocks, they don't sit on top of one another, so therefore it's very easy for them to fall down. So I was demonstrating that to them, but them experiencing what happens if you shake the, 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 the table. <laughs> the next one I'm gonna look at here is the effect of what we call living walls on energy and in the environment. And here, there are basically three types of living walls. You're looking at green, green facades, living walls, and bio walls. And typical green facades have um, attachment on the outside, and then plants grow on the wall. Uh, you can actually have what you call living walls, where the, 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 the plant growth is embedded within the wall itself. I think at the ends of the, of, of the building here, there's actually one of the living walls in there, which is a very useful material for energy reduction. It's mainly through insulation, that's what it does. And then we have, of course, bio walls, which are in, interior applications. Fundamentally, my applications are looking at these two <coughs> examples here, which is the, the green facade or living wall example. Uh, we had a small uh, box built up at the University of Miami. We put in sensors. Um, in the corner, because that area doesn't have that enough insulation, in the center, and also in the middle of the building. And we just put, you know, like flowers, plants, little gardens to make it look nice. And with that little box there, with that thing being the way it is, south facing, we're able to monitor the temperature over um, a period. And if you looked at this temperature here, you find that if you look at this wall here, it doesn't have any, any, any green walls on it, and that's the temperature profile. It's a big drop up and down. When you have the green wall, the profile is much lower. So you have these swings which are much lower just because you're using this living wall um, within, the, within, within the, the facade. So this idea that you can use nature, bring nature into the building to reduce the energy intake into the building and control the temperature within the building and also make it look very nice um, in terms of design. Uh, the other one here, going to nature, relying on the idea that the ground temperature uh, below one, one meter, which is about three feet, four feet, is fairly constant. Now, if you look at thermal comfort under ASHRAE, uh, the thermal comfort area is this area here, but you can expand it just by relying on, on other areas there. So if you look at Miami, for example, most temperatures actually sit in this zone here, which is very hot and humid. So the idea is to expand that area of comfort by using uh, passive principles here. So that's the area we're looking at, which is extended comfort, mainly because of applying what you call passive principles. So you see most of times you can be comfortable in Miami just by applying passive principles, which is May to October. So 
in this design with nature, we're looking at the idea that comes by mimicry, looking at um, a rat called uh, Jerboa, which burrows underground for 1.5 meters. It does that because the temperature at this point here is fairly stable. So what we did here was that we basically did simulation. We didn't build this because to dig them in Miami is very difficult. So we basically get um, the idea on relying on thermal inertia of the ground for cooling or for heating in this case, if you're, if you're in Boulder. And generally, from observation, the temperature differences here on the ground here is only very small, about 8.5, 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit, lower than the, the temperature outside. <coughs> so in, in my case here, what we did was we, we took a simple box uh, to present a house, uh, dug the ground and put some pipes in there through simulation. Of course, I didn't build it because it's difficult to build there. And run the pipes to see what happens. And by doing that, we, we found out that we can actually get the temperatures to drop out very quickly to about, um, to about, um, sorry, I'm going too quickly there. The temperature can drop down to about 24, 24 degrees, which is about 73 Fahrenheit, which is fairly comfortable. So you can drop it very quickly from 80s to 74, just by using natural ventilation. It's gonna be humid, but you can reduce humidity by other means. So that's one of the things we're, gonna, we're working on there to show that you can use the earth Earth profile, nature, to actually cool buildings without relying on air conditioning systems. Um, also, we checked for water concentration, for humidity, and we found that it stabilizes very quickly, so it wasn't a big issue. So we can actually have condensation and remove water very easily. So the question then becomes, should we use active system or passive system? The balance here basically talks about almost free energy on passive systems. They're very simple to use. But of course, sometimes uh, when it gets too hot or too cold, you may need to use active systems. So I think hybrid approach is more like it, more than one or the other. So I think hybrid system is very important. The, but the bulk can come from passive systems. That's the argument that we're having here. The other one is looking at energy consumption, which is the way we measure things through building code. We talk about the energy consumptions per square foot, and we were arguing that the metrics sometimes is not very fair because it, it rewards some buildings more than others. Uh, buildings that are taller uh, will actually consume more in heating or cooling, but that's not reflected in energy consumption per square foot, which is the metric that you use for measuring. So the argument is that if you do simulation, we use the volume, but when you measure, we look at annual energy per square foot. So if I show example of several houses that we looked at here, uh, we looked at energy consumption of these different buildings, and if you look at them, um, for example, if you look at consumption per person here, this building here, the, the second one consumes more. It has a pool that's always consuming more. But when you, when you come down to energy consumption per square foot per person, then the differences become very small. So the metrics of measurement becomes very, very important in that sense. And if you look at the profile of consumption over time over the day, uh, you can see the swings are not driven by temperature, but swings are actually driven by uh, maybe profile of behavior. So if you look at that, probably that's breakfast time. That's probably around lunch, lunch time or something like that. That's dinner time or something of that nature. So that's what drives the profile more than actually the climate. So human behavior becomes very, very important in looking at how, cli um, how much consumption is, is done in the building. Uh, that's another example. If I use volume, I bring volume in, and suddenly the building that consumed less, if you go back here, this building here, which was a low consumer down here, suddenly consumes more because it has a bigger volume a building there because the volume is now considered. So the metric of measurement becomes very important in terms of how we, we measure buildings and how we, we evaluate them and say this building is a lead platinum, lead gold, because they don't actually mean anything unless you consider these things here. So what you learn from here is that metric is important. Building characteristics is important in terms of window sizes, window orientations. Also, user behavior becomes very important because behavior drives cons uh, energy consumption. Also, understanding and changes in IOQ in the, in the space becomes important. Knowing why people are, are turning heating on or off becomes important. So if you look at architectural education, so research coming into education, we are looking at the issue of collaborative teaching, which comes from my engagement in community engagement, the issue of working with academics in other areas in ar than architecture, so working with engineers, working with sociologists, and bringing courses that actually embed these things together. 
So if I come in here, I'm going to show you an example of what you're working on uh, at the University of Miami. Uh, this is the profile. I'm going to show you that live. So this is actually sensor, which is on some labs, but buildings measuring the temperature right now, temperature, humidity, and what's going on. And it's useful because it can tell you what's, what is happening in the energy consumption, and you can begin to question people what happened the day before. So I'll, I'll just take you to the website. Let me see if I can get this guy here. There you go. So this is happening live right now. Just drop it there. So this is live. And if you look at this profile here, uh, it, this is very strange. And you see the temperature rising like that, about 87 degrees. So when the temperature goes up that high, air conditioning is going to run in to try and cool it down. So if you look at this energy consumption of, for the whole year, you will never pick up these issues here because the profile is fairly flat. But if you break it down into smaller units, you can begin to see what's going on and begin to question this. Because it could be driven by human behavior. It could be driven by somebody leaving a window open. I do not know what it is. So we need to check that um, when I go back and we'll find out what happened that week. So knowing what's happening at a typical time becomes very useful in terms of controlling um, the consumption. Um, this is humidity levels in, the, in the, those rooms right now. And this is lighting in those rooms. Lighting, for whatever reason, lighting was very high at this time, which is about 4 or 5 o'clock, and you begin to question why the lighting levels are very high. Did somebody just turn the lights and leave? They're leaving work at 5 o'clock. Why is the lighting high? So if lighting is high at that point and then went off, then we need to find out what is driving it, because that's energy consumption that we shouldn't be having. So by knowing those little nuances, we look at cause and effect in consumption uh, through behavior, and we can begin to change how things occur in terms of consumption. which takes me back to the issue of epidemiology and the research that I work on in epidemiology. Um, before I do that, let me just, uh, just maybe just talk about it. Um, epidemiological research takes the idea that if you look at public health, public health system, they understand that, say, Ebola is appearing here, and Ebola is appearing here, and it's appearing somewhere else. And they begin to map locations of the appearance to people who have traveled. So the link, they make linkages to those things there. So the idea of this system here is to be, begin to make linkages to those spikes on energy consumption to a behavior within the building. That's the idea behind this. And it's happening live very quickly. And also begin to, to report them. So for example, if you look at a cohort of buildings, so that residential buildings, and we see this happening in somebody's house, we can send a message to them, because you have a code that, that writes that, send a message to you in, in the forum says, Oh, your house is just consuming X amount of energy, way more than your neighbor. Well, what's going on? And by knowing that your neighbor is consuming less, you begin to change your behavior to reduce that consumption. Now, in terms of education, architects are social, social reformer. So in this case, we look at clients uh, who can actually be engaged with. So teaching students to begin to engage uh, clients becomes very important. For this studio setting where I'm working with students, identifying strengths of different areas, <laughs> and community to ensure that they understand how they can engage and frame a question for community rather than just getting a client deciding what's supposed to be done, but engaging, um, engaging a process of design. Um, last one is adaptive process, where you have kinetic process of response. In this case, we, we built uh, four, uh, three boxes, basically. And what we did was we used these blinds which are responding, and we're using um, something called Adreno to control the blind as the sun changes. And we're checking which blind orientation is better for that location, which is Miami in this case. And we look at energy profiles for each. No blind, which is the reference. Horizontal blinds, vertical blinds, combined blinds. And looking at what the energy savings could be just by using a system that responds rather than a fixed um, brisole system. And the results were that if you were to use a combined system, you get a much better energy savings, which is the bottom line here, which is the bottom one here. Without the blinds, that's the energy profile. And with the blinds, which are changing, that's the energy profile. So basically, it becomes flatter. It's much better. So it's actually perhaps using technology, which is very cheap now. We can use that to control the blinds, to control how much light comes in. The last thing that I work on is I have a network that I work with, network of collaborators from around the world, which is Zemt Network. Uh, we have guys from parts of Africa, go back, parts of Africa here, from Europe, from Asia from Australia, South America, and we're working together to just examine things that relate to energy consumption through um, housing in particular. 
So that's the way the network works. And this is just some of the trips we have um, to Japan to look at their, their system of building, uh, prefabricated building, well insulated to reduce energy consumption. So we, we arrange trips to take guys across to Japan to just look at how Sanyo and Toshiba have been very much engaged in housing and how they, they, they are, they're very conscious of energy consumption. Um, host conferences once a year to ensure that this work is actually uh, presented and discussed. This is Glasgow 2012. This was in Miami in 2013, hosting conferences. And also, uh, the last thing is looking at my relationship to my research and my teaching at the city. And my research, that's the area of my research, the area of my teaching, and that's my area of practice, which is limited, but it's still there. I teach technology, climate change and health, energy use in buildings. And in teaching, I teach technology as well. So I, I'm tying in those two together. And I tie them also through practice, community engagement, um, consultancy. And I link the two teaching and research through the B Act, the M Act, the PhD students. So in this case, it would be undergraduate students here and PhD students, solar decathlon, um, tying in those together. Uh, in terms of research and practice through industry collaboration, um, what we call K 12 days demonstrations, summer programs, and also through uh, what we call Living City Studios, Living Life Projects to tie in teaching and practice through engagement and of course support through Natural Science Foundation mainly to try and bring this thing together. And finally, the reason why I work very hard are those two little boys there to keep me busy. So that's my inspiration to work very hard. My wife Natalia and Eduardo who's almost five and Juan is a year and seven months. And that's it. That's what I could share with you.